Hello, welcome to Art Show. I'm Craig Stover, and today I have with me Stuart Rome. Hey, Stuart, how are you? How you doing, Craig? I'm doing fine. I wanted to share, start sharing uh, images of yours just to begin with, to give those people who might not know about your work a little bit of uh, background. And I was hoping I could get you to just say a few words about uh, some of these pictures. I've always loved this. Yeah, well, it's the first series of mine that got any attention in the 70s. My first show at the International Museum of Photography at the George Eastman House. Uh -huh. um, I think I was in my 20s when I was doing this work. And uh, I, I thought that, um, like in writing programs, they tell you to write what you know. I was photographing where I grew up and my friends who uh, were, you know, heck, they were trying to figure out how to live off the grid. So um, I don't know if you can even see, but in the lower and the upper left hand corner, there's a small shack at there where um, I lived for the better part of a summer and I worked in New York uh, at a really fancy gallery three days a week. But this is where I was living and my friend George's son, Adrian, had a great imagination and he posed for me one day. But, you know, this is what I photographed um, in Connecticut and um, uh, in Rochester, New York, where I just finished school for the better part of two or three years. This is a series called Modern Mythologies. Was the, was the suit his? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, like most, I don't know about you, but when I was his age, I, I wanted to be Superman desperately and fly away. Oh, from yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. And then I, I saw this one, too. I just, this this just lines, I love the geometry behind this. Well, this, this you know, every every picture has a story and these pictures were meant to be short stories in themselves um, so that if you looked at them for a while, you could decode uh, some sort of messages that were in them. And this is probably the last in the uh, series of modern mythologies. This was my girlfriend at the time who had given me my walking papers and I had to pack up a van and leave a small town we were living in, which was Tucson, Arizona. This must have been um, 1983 because I didn't want to live in the same small town she did. So I was pulling away. I saw her standing in the middle of the street, and I stopped the car, got out, made that photograph. You can see, actually. I see the shadow. My shadow on her chest. And I couldn't look at this picture for a number of years. It was too painful to see. But uh, 10 years later, we ended up getting back together. And that woman, Catherine, is my wife now. So really? it's, uh, one of my, That's her. it's one of my, okay. it's one of my very favorite photographs. That's fantastic. I really like that. That was a good yeah, one. but you know what kind of person does that? What kind of person, you know, artists. Let's just yeah, leave it at yeah, that. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when I first uh, met you and saw some of your work, these are actually some of the first images I saw of yours. What a way to start, well, right? Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I really wanted to learn about other cultures that weren't like mine because the one I was living in looked like it was woefully short of uh, good sense and magic. Um, all the magic seemed to be, you know, uh, taken away from um, Western culture. And so I wanted to, uh, to visit places where I could learn a lot. And, and uh, I didn't have the money to do that. So um, I had considered actually getting a master's and PhD in archaeology and anthropology at Wesleyan University after finishing my undergraduate in art. And um, the head of that program talked me out of it because he loved photography and he said that uh, if I worked for archaeologists and anthropologists, um, they would pay me for the privilege to teach me things they would never share with their own students. <laughs> and so I, I ended up doing that for a while. And I thought that maybe my, my role was to play something transitional between being a fine art photographer and a cultural anthropologist. And so I went to Haiti to photograph, in particular, uh, this voodoo ceremony in uh, in um, Plan de Nord, where people um, took on the aspect of uh, a, a god that was had attributes to, to fire and war, and that's the reason why mud is used because it's a you know it's an indication of iron. And um, I w I also went there to study with to actually to interview and to learn from um, Andre Pierre, who was Maya Darren's teacher. Uh, I don't know if you know who that was, but she was a great filmmaker in the fifties. And she went to Haiti to make a movie and documentary um, and also to make some films. 
and she ended up becoming a priestess, a voodoo priestess. Huh. Um, not bad for a little Jewish girl from Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> Who but else so, but artists? And and, and uh, her teacher was still alive. It was a great painter. And so I got to spend time with him. And he opened up the possibilities of photographing there, along with the um, uh, uh, the gallerist, uh, Randall Morris, who ran a gallery in, Cal in uh, New York, that uh, he took me along on this trip. For me, that's it's. I, I love the color in this, the... The mud colors, the reflections, the shadows, the tones on the skin. It just, that one works for me. Plus the, the whole storyline itself is just amazing. Well, yeah. I mean, once again, was my, my goal was always to see if I could tell a story in a single image. Were you in your like late twenties by then or? Um, I was in my early thirties. This, early this 30s. was still back from uh, modern mythologies pictures. So I was in my twenties when this show opened. I must okay. have been backwards. When, I think I was 24, 25 when that first show opened. <clears throat> so this was just striking. I mean, how could you not take a photograph of that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, it's a little literal, but yeah, I like right. it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like about it. It beats you over the head with it, you know? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Um, these pictures have gotten some interest recently for completely different reasons. Yeah. But out of the blue, I got a, um, a note from, um, one of the museums in London, I can't remember which one it is. Um, it might have been the Portrait Gallery, I can't remember. But the, the uh, a conservator there had come across this photograph of mine, you know, from the 1970s in Connecticut, because they had the exact same statue and the head had been knocked off too. So she <laughs> thought it was just so odd. And they, she was writing an article about it and asked if she could reproduce it. And I said, absolutely. That's it. <laughs> it, now, now knowing that story, I kind of want to make a mold of it, make like <laughs> copies and copies and sell them in a gift shop or something. I just, yeah, I just love that. This one I hadn't seen before. This was, yeah. this was wild. Yeah. What's the story? Yeah. Well, I, I, um, after the, uh, Haiti project, um, came out, um, some of those pictures were published in a, uh, in a, um, mag in a Aperture magazine. Um, and, uh, I think Jonathan Demi, the filmmaker, um, produced, well, oversaw that issue. And, uh, then, uh, he helped with a traveling show. So it brought some attention to that work and the combination of what I'd done in, um, Latin America before the Maya book that I'd done with anthropologists and archeologists, along with the Haiti book kind of got piqued the interest of um, an art collector family in Dallas that had a big collection of Indonesian reliquary objects going back to the Bronze Age. So they contacted me and asked if I would be interested in photographing their collection like I did for the Maya book. Okay. And, then, and then begin traveling in Indonesia to photograph how objects like that were still used in remote areas. So, you know, I, I, I traveled to a lot of those places this was a trip I made with um, John Fall, who was my teacher. That's a whole nother story, but <laughs> it's in a it's in a, a, a village, an area called Tana Taraja, where there's a necropolis where people use um, the bones that have been kind of uh, brought back up um, after being buried, and they're used as decorative objects. And that piece of wood that they're on that's carved is sort of a ship. Uh, mm. It's a spirit ship. And uh, in the in the um, rocks above, those are the um, the areas that all of these uh, bodies are are buried in, and they have effigy figures surrounding them that are very famous called Tau Tau. So I went to see those, but this struck me as being kind of remarkable. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious to know is it is it just coincidence that it seems like your older work was more figurative, and now you you're you're is your current work, there seems to be less figures in it. Is that true or is that just coincidence? Well, it's a combination of things. You know, when I photographed in Indonesia on and off for something like eight or nine years, um, at one point uh, I was traveling with um, a gamelan orchestra. Uh, we used to travel in a sand truck from village to village when they put on these shows. And I was having a conversation with the head of the gamelan and he was telling me, you know, because he knew how much I loved being there. And he said, you yeah. know, this is really not your culture. You know that. I know that you know that. But he said, eventually what you're going to do is you're going to bring back what you learn and you're going to um, and it will be in uh, the work that you'll begin to do. So it'll yeah. be 
it'll be um, inspired by what you learned. And it couldn't have been, it, it couldn't have been closer to the truth because okay. um, in Indonesia, when I photograph for people who spoke to the landscape uh, directly, often in trance, and the landscape was clearly speaking back to them. So I had this idea that if I could make landscape photographs that looked like that conversation, both mm -hmm. to and from, um, that's what I wanted to do. And that's when this, the uh, forest pictures began, that last photograph of the waterfall, that's when that, that body work began. And, um, and that was published as a monograph, and I think in around 2005. Yeah, yeah. And so I remember I, those that you have them, those are printed rather large. Yeah, yeah. And so I, um, I had this idea, whenever I come across, uh, so patterning is a really important part of my work too. And that is from looking at um, indigenous works of art from Latin America and from Southeast Asia, mostly yeah. weaving, because the ideas that are in those, uh, those textiles are woven together from things that were seen in the natural world. And so anytime I see a pattern that references something like that, something goes off in me. And so um, in, in the, I think it was in the late 1990s and early 2000s, um, I was photographing sea caves that looked like places of emergence, kind of like, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, they, were, it, they were powerful things for me to see. And so, um, after the fourth book came out, I decided to take a little break and I went camping uh, in Northern California and I saw one of these trees. Um, they're called telescope trees or chimney trees. Uh, and what they are are remnants of the old growth redwood and sequoia forest. Um, and they can be, these trees can be 3000 years old or even older. And uh, the hardwood can burn out and that being the largest things in the forest they tend to um, uh, call lightning from the sky. Mm. And, and actually sequoias can't have fertilized pine cones unless they've been burned. So there's this sort of like conversation with that world. And so the inner core of those trees can burn out. That, that's dead wood. As long as the, the roots are still in the ground, the, um, the tree can be hollow, but still 250 feet up, mm -hmm. uh, hold an entire forest of trees like them and they're different trees as well. I see you and have so, some, you've got some behind you as well there. The yeah, I'm, oh. I'm, working, I'm working on finishing a show that's gonna go up in a couple of weeks. Okay, all right. So what do you, what do you shoot those on? Well, these were, the, these were the last film project I did too. So they were shot okay. with, a, with a Hasselblad. And then um, to, to get all the information out from them, often I made two or three different exposures. Okay. I, I'd scan the film using a um, high-end scanner. I combined parts of the shadows, highlights, and midtones into a, single, into a single image, and then I would print them digitally, and I would use those digital files as a master for mm -hmm. then creating new negatives that were four by five negatives that I could print in the darkroom. So I so print them both. This sounds like a, a process you, you've been developing over years. Over like years, the, yeah. yeah. And do you do your own printing? I do. This is okay. my digital studio here, and Very my nice. darkroom is adjacent to this room. Okay. So I, I'd like to. I'm going to shift gears on us a little bit. I want to. I want to bring our viewers back to really the your your start. Uh, can you remember? Um, this is, I just love asking this question. Do you remember your first like real exposure to art as a kid? Did you oh, have? God, yeah. Uh, well, no, yeah. Okay. Very, what was very, it? You know, it's kind of be, sound like a cliche, uh -huh. but we were taken on a field trip to the very first um, retrospective of Van Gogh at the Museum of Modern Art. Yeah. I might have been eleven or twelve years old, huh. and uh, that was mind blowing. And I and I I was very um, unsatisfied child growing up in suburban Connecticut. Uh -huh. I was constantly depressed. And so I read, for escape, I would read biographies, you know, those children's versions of biographies of artists, mostly musicians. Uh -huh. So at first I thought I was going to be a musician. Uh -huh. Then I saw that Van Gogh show and I wanted to be a painter, but I didn't have natural skill. Uh -huh. And I was constantly being told by teachers in my elementary school that I had no skill as an <laughs> artist. 
All right, bummer. Mm-hmm. So uh, it wasn't. A, so I assumed I was going to be a writer because I love okay. reading too. When, um, when, and, when did the first camera end up in your hands? Were you a, well, were you a it, kid? Well, that's that's ironic too because my dad had a camera store, and because of that, I had no interest <laughs> in photography. Really? None. You see, <laughs> none. none. And in my and you know he, um, my dad was a good guy, but he also was. Um, kind of on the cheap side okay. so if i wanted a camera i could never get a good camera really yeah, yeah. so huh. i um i in fact you know i met i remember the first time i went out of the country i wanted a decent camera and i bought it from his store you know and of course he gave me a good deal right <laughs> but i bought it with my you know my my um day my monthly allowance uh-huh. and he wouldn't let me take it with me because he thought i would <laughs> So I had to take a piece of crap camera with me that uh, that all the all the film I shot, none of it came out because the shutter broke halfway through oh. the trip. <laughs> so I had very little interest in photography, but I had a really yeah. good friend in, in high school who was um, really interested in photography in the 60s, this was. Okay. And so-, uh, and so we were good friends, and so we started photographing together, and that's how I became interested in photography. okay so yeah because my my next question was who taught you these processes and essentially you know who lit the fire about your passion was it was it your friend about it was my friend and then okay. at, in my high school they had um you know for students that weren't doing that well they had um, you know home act for the women and uh they had auto um repair for the guys like but in between, in between that was a graphic arts program to teach people printing technology and darkroom skills. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it could get you out of classes. <laughs> and and so I started using the darkroom, which not many people were using back then. Right. And I, I spent a lot of time there. So uh, you, you started doing photography. Your friend sort of, you know, lit the fire a little bit. At what point do you think you slid from, you know, just taking photographs to actually, you know, considering what you were doing was making art? Was there a, was there a well, time? You know, yeah, I mean, what happened was while I was in high school, I went to see a few shows at the Museum of Art, Modern Art um, that made a big impression on me. One was the, the, the first at J show, mm-hmm. uh, which was, which blew my mind. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then there was the uh, the famous show with um, Lee Friedlander, Gary Winogrand, and Diane Arbus. I, you mm-hmm. know, it took my breath away, and I <laughs> wanted to be Diane Arbus so badly. But I think many people of my generation felt the same way. Yeah. So right away, right after that, everything I did, I thought of was art. I mean, it took twenty years before the first piece <laughs> would pass that test. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I I was convinced that I was. You know, somebody special. Uh huh. Yeah, a lot of artists share that same. Uh, I don't know what we want to call it. <laughs> Blindness, or it's or... called hubris. Hubris. Yeah, there we go. That's that's the well, word. So, I was you know what? What I think happens is, if you think you've got something in your DNA to say, you right. don't even know what it is that you're going to say yet, but you're convinced that you've got it. Mm-hmm. There's something that you know that propels you forward. At a yeah. young age, when you got, we've got nothing to show. I um, used to get called cocky, so I was like, "No, this is just what I want to do." So, <laughs> yeah, like and I, you know, when I was in, and when I was in college, it was really hard for me to take um, uh, instruction from some teachers unless they had proved to me that they were good artists themselves. <laughs> I was kind of a jerk yeah, in many well. ways, but I was lucky because I had amazing teachers. I mean, uh-huh. I. John Fall was not only my teacher, he, John Fall was a great 70s artist and he was my teacher and he took interest in me and I ended up becoming, working for him, staying with he, him and his wife in Buffalo during the summers working on the series he did called Altered Landscapes, which changed the, um, the, the art of the uh, photography in the 1970s. And then my other teacher of note was Betty Hahn, who was an amazing thinker and a great photographer. Mm-hmm. So a great artist. So between the two of them, I even though I was kind of a jerk, I had this these two teachers that I did respect and listened to everything they said. 
it, that's you actually you're answering my questions before I even ask him. So so let me ask you a very kind of geeky question that I want to answer. Yeah. Uh, so when I first came across your work, uh, the first pieces I saw in in physical form were rather giant. I think they were like maybe forty inch. Yeah. Uh, so they were they were really big, and but it was the later works with the landscapes and the waterfall and whatnot. And I, I, I remember looking at them and thinking to myself, they need to be big. You know, they just, they scream. I would love to yeah. see them life-size kind of a thing. But I also know that you do do smaller work. Obviously, you know, I don't think they're proofs behind you, or maybe they are. Um, so, you know, the smaller is more intimate kind of thing. Where's your happy spot? Where do you love to see most of your images? That's a good question. Uh, you know, and I'll tell you, every body of work has a different... Um, demand you know for instance you know when i first started doing the the tree pictures which i call oculus um making big prints was so part of the art world at that point that i wanted to do just the opposite so i tried to make them as small as i could i um, thinking that you know uh i want to see how powerful they are right. at a very small size but they they're architectural so like you said, they demanded to be really big too. So the really, the, the prints that I make for public viewing for museums, et cetera, are, um, they're like three or three feet uh, square. Not, not that's modest in size by today's standards, but I do make them 19 inches as well. It's the smallest size I can get away with where they, they still announce what they are. And I make them that size because I'd like them to be in people's homes as well. And I don't think people have those kinds of spaces generally. Yeah, so, that's true. I found and, that, that especially in New York, they want tiny spaces. Well, there's that. And I, you know, I look at these, for me, the, the photographs are machinery that works. So they're like, um, you know, they're, they're like, uh, what is it called? You know, it's, they work, for me, they work in, in some ways like, um, tantric paintings where they have a, a purpose mm -hmm. if you look at them a, a while they change your perceptions so they have a catalyst they act like a catalyst that's what I'm looking for yeah. and in yeah. that catalyst they open up a world that you might not have expected to see you know when I, when I had my very first show at the Eastman House I watched people walk in and look at the show kind of like I just watched nobody knew who I was I would was just sitting there and I would watch people move very quickly through the show because you could get the pictures and what they were saying fairly quickly. And I wanted, I made my, it my goal over the next 40 years to stop people to look at photographs where the pictures could change over a period of 30 years, looking at them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, that was my goal anyways. So uh, if you have a, a modest sized print that's 20 inches, by, by the way, a 20 inch print in 1971 was gigantic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I remember the first time I saw a 20 by 24 print, I couldn't believe how big it was. <laughs> right. But you know, photographers now want to inhabit the same territorial space yeah. as paint sculpture, which it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So um I so you know it's one more tool in, that you can play with in the toolbox. Yeah. Also, you know, photography almost doesn't exist anymore. Because the palette that we played with was was reality is no longer believable. Yeah, yeah. So I'm one speaking of mediums, you know, talking about photographers wanting to lo use larger spaces, but I'm at the same time there's been so much that's that's moved us forward uh, as artists, technological wise. What I'm getting at is that you've got a couple of books, right? Yeah. So. So the artists, so artists can now, you know, create their own books or it's, it's not as hard to have things in book form anymore, which is very personal kind of a uh, thing yeah. when, when you have these books. I was, for myself, I'm curious, are you considering to doing any additional books? Well, I've been trying to get uh, Oculus uh, published. Okay. And I've been All right. sending it out to publishers and I have, um, I have two writers writing for me. Uh, one has already written a, a small introduction, and that's um, Craig Dykers, who's the CEO okay. of the architectural firm Snoheta. They okay. built the SF MoMA, the library in Alexandria, the Danish Opera House. They, 
He's quite an amazing designer and architect. He's written a wonderful piece talking about these pictures because he has a great love of, of, the, uh, of the idea of the Oculus. They're in most of his buildings. Okay. And then one of my very favorite writers, Wade Davis, has offered to write a companion text if I can get a book publisher. All right. so, well, let's maybe this video put a little pressure on the people to move things. Yeah, <laughs> from here, let's, you know, I'm a I'm an older guy, um, and it's not it's not it's harder for an older guy to yeah. get projects off the ground. And I'm not a um, a uh, uh, I'm not a well known photographer, so you know it's hard it's a harder sale. Well, but this I, I this will change all that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I do have I do have three books under my belt so far. So yeah, I'll... I I love the book. So this I, this is um, I got two more questions for you. Uh, this is an odd question, but you had mentioned, you know, the idea that an artist uh, needs to or can play with an image to see how strong the image is. So it, you were saying that you were making them small to see do the images stand up, and I know for myself, I I realize that I do the same thing with color and realize that if I remove color, is the image still strong? Uh, you know, is it, is it still sort of, does the image fall apart and does it just rely on color anymore? Sure. And you've really, uh, you know, you almost seem, unless I'm incorrect in this and what I'm seeing, uh, you seem to shoot mostly in black and white now. No. Uh, okay, so I got to so then that's perfect. <laughs> Let me ask my question, which is, tell me what you think about color. Well, to me, uh, color is the, um, is the uh, medium of, uh, of emotions, of feelings, um, of dreams. And uh, black and white is more about architecture. Mm -hmm. It's more about structure. Um, mm -hmm. And, and in, in some ways, it's the bones of a picture. Sometimes a picture only needs the bones. But, um, you know, filling in the space with color is really quite something. And so I my work has always been, actually, when I first began, it was all color. And uh, by the 90s, it was uh, probably more black and white, but I still always worked in color as well. Mm. But the works that were successful were the black and white works. Because I'm going to need to go through your, your files then to see the yeah. different color stuff. Well, because I, I was stripping everything down to find out what it is I wanted to speak about. But um, actually, most all of the work I'm doing in the last six or eight years has been predominantly color. In oh. fact, when COVID began, um, I guess I was searching around for a new project. I still kind of am. Mm -hmm. But I started making these river pictures that are very dreamy. I think there's, there is one. I don't know if you can even see it, but it's in the back. Yeah. Um, well, that's yeah. what I've always liked about your work. It was always you, you're. You tell a very clear story in your work, and uh, it's it's the to me it's the eye of somebody who who has a keen eye. Like you 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 understand where the picture starts and stops. So I've always loved that. So I have I have time for just one more question. You know, time uh -huh. flies when you're having fun. It's a question I ask a lot of my friends, and sometimes I've found people get these questions right away. Sometimes they stumble. So I'm curious to see. Uh, simple question. What does making art do for you? Oh, it's like it's like a it's like caffeine. It's like <laughs> a drug. I, without without doing that process, I feel like life is dull and listless. Huh. But um, a good idea in process is uh, pure energy. And you know, William Blake said energy is is um, pure delight. I mean, it is it is it's the delight of living for me. That's fantastic. Well, I, you know, asking you these questions gives me like 20 more questions. So I'll have to, <laughs> I'll have to give you a phone call and ask it some more questions later on. But I want to thank you very much for taking the time to be with me today to answer my, my question. Pleasure. I really appreciate it. I want to thank everybody who tuned in to watch. Please make sure to like and subscribe. Your subscriptions help encourage us to make more of these. We really appreciate it. Uh, also, if you have any questions for Stuart, you can always put them in the comments section. I can move them on, uh, pass them on. Uh, happy to do so. But again, thank you, Stuart, for your time today. It was wonderful. And I look forward to seeing your next exhibition. Okay, one plug. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the, the Oculus Pictures are opening in Philadelphia September 24th 
at the new at the uh, Space Art Gallery. Okay, fantastic. I'll, see, I'll, I'll, I'll put in some a link or something like that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Right. Take Bye -bye. care.